Dr. Werner Vogels is currently in charge of implementing new technologies at Amazon. Before joining Amazon, he was a successful entrepreneur at the forefront of the development and deployment of cloud technology around the world. Information Week recognized Vogels for his education and promotional role in cloud computing with the 2008 CIO slash CTO of the Year Award. Henry Elkis is the founder and CEO of Helena, which is creating a network of global leaders from multiple generations. Their aim is to discover and implement solutions to the pressing global issues of today. Pierre Alain Masson launched the first worldwide startup competition in 2013. He now runs Seed Stars World, an international organization working to impact people's lives by supporting entrepreneurs in 80 developing economies. Rania Rostam is the Chief Innovation Officer at General Electrics in the Middle East, North Africa, and Turkey. She specializes in providing solutions for advanced manufacturing, industrial internet, and collaborative innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to the session in this forum that if we were giving out prizes for the best title, I am sure that we would win it. Fast, fun, funky. It is all about collaboration for innovation. And that should be a question mark there. How do you collaborate for innovation? I don't need to tell any of you gathered here today in Riyadh that innovation is an urgent priority for organizations and for all of you. You, in fact, have to personify innovation. This isn't just about thinking out of the box. This is about throwing away the box. We have a fantastic panel here this morning, which will also be fast, fun, and funky. Two innovators at World Class Standard, two entrepreneurs. They started young even at the age of 15. And we even have an innovator who works in government, who says that he's not just a disciplinarian, he is anti-disciplinarian. Let's get started. Werner Vogels, all the way from Seattle. Let's set the stage. Amazon, the world's biggest company by revenue, internet company. How do you do it? OK, so let me um, I'm give him some time to actually talk to you guys about Amazon principles. So if I can get my slides up, please, that would be nice. Thank you. My slides. So people have been thinking about Amazon as being one of the most innovative companies in the world for a very long time. And so um, we have this um, motto that says, work hard, have fun, make history. And so by now, this is 25 years old. So people continue to ask us, how do you, con how do you remain so innovative even after you've become so successful. It's one of the biggest challenges most entrepreneurs have. So we have this principle that we experiment continuously, measure relentlessly, and then learn. And learn is the most important part of your whole entrepreneurial process, because many of the products that you will build, yeah, it's something isn't an experiment if you already know what the outcome is. Yeah, so it's highly uncertain what you're going to deliver, so you need to learn from it. And so this continuous cycle of experimentation, measurement, and learning is crucial. And it needs to be part of your DNA, this notion of innovation. You can't just wake up one morning and say, oh, I would like to become innovative. And for that, you need to have a number of parts in your whole process, in what you do, that need to fit together. On one hand, it needs to be culture. You need to have a focus for where your innovation drives to. You need to have an organizational structure in place that helps you drive that. And then you need technology. Uh, so we won't talk much about the technology today, but the Amazon Web Services, which is the world's largest cloud computing division, sort of powers most of Amazon's innovation. Culture means that you need to have a direction where you want to innovate into. And for Amazon's motto has been forever to be the Earth's most customer-centered company. So our innovation our, our culture principle gives us direction to our innovation. If we're innovating, we're innovating on behalf of our customers. And sometimes it is really important to think about, not about all the new cool stuff that you're going to do, but what are the things that will never change for your customers? If things never change, any innovation you put in that direction will benefit your customers forever. For example, in retail, there might be the size of your catalog. The larger the size of the catalog, the more likely it is that customers will be able to find the products they're looking for, or faster delivery. 
or lower pricing. All these, all these parts, if you do innovation in those areas that never change for your customers, that will remain important forever, you will become important for your customers as well. It does require commitment sometimes, yeah, because not always are the products that you are building are going to be immediately successful. So you may be stubborn on your vision, but you have to be flexible on the details, which means that you know where you want to go, exactly how to get there, you need to be a bit more flexible about it. For example, when we launched sellers on Amazon third parties, we did three, four times a reboot before we actually had found the right mechanism for our customers to work there. Also, you have to be willing to be misunderstood for long periods of time. There's two people that will misunderstand you. One, your friends and family who are just ignorant and have actually no clue what you're doing. Uh, and they will be sort of wondering, what the hell are you doing? And then there is your potential competitors who will try to discredit you and on purpose misunderstand you. You have to deal with both of these groups of people very carefully. An important part there is decisions are often two-way doors, meaning that there are hardly any decisions that you make that you cannot come back from. And so it means that you can start making these decisions without having access to 100% information. Often you have to wait until you know all the things that you need to know, you're too late. So you might as well start executing when you're at 70% of your knowledge. Because when you get through that door, you're going to learn a lot. And probably you're going to learn a lot faster than if you just wait until you know everything. Mostly because most decisions are two-way doors and you can come back from them. It's important to remain very nimble. Make your team small, not larger than 10 to 12 people. If they're that small, they actually really can communicate with each other and you don't need to have meetings to tell each other what you're doing. And it's also important that you continue to keep an, uh, a culture of driving innovation. Now, you must have been in a meeting, probably you have done more meetings than anybody else, and there's always someone in that meeting, when you propose something new, that says, that won't work. Yeah? Our customers won't like that. And then the person that actually wants to promote this yeah, has to do all the work. As Amazon, we've turned this around. If you want to block something, you have to do all the work. Yeah, we take care of 95% of all objections that there are. It does mean that we do a lot of experiments that we maybe shouldn't be doing. But quite a few of those experiments have paid off really well. Also, go to a structure where nobody does PowerPoint presentations. Uh, definitely not like I do them now. Yeah? but where you actually force people to write down their ideas. We have a whole process called what's called the narrative. Basically, every meeting starts with six pages written by someone, which we read in silence for 30 minutes. And why? Because after those 30 minutes, everybody's on the same page. And we know all exactly what we are talking about. If you have a PowerPoint presentation, everybody starts to complain at slide number two, and the other half of the room is on their phones. So forcing everybody to read and be on the same page gives you very good discussions, gives you high quality insight. It's also very important because if you write a six page document, it's very hard to write it and not have absolute clarity of thought. And so I want to leave you with sort of the process that we have to make sure that the things that we build are really targeted at our customers. Remember, we want to be the Earth's most customer-centric company, so we need to have a product development methodology that puts customers central. So it's called working from the customer backwards. Because what you want to do if you're a technology company like Amazon, you want to make sure that you build exactly that which you built for your customer and not more. Do not let the engineers be in charge. So the first thing we do in our process is write a press release for the product that we're going to build. There's another press release that will go out. But in a press release, you write in very clear and simple terms exactly that what you're going to deliver. And then you write the FAQ, or the root FAQ. So the 10 to 20 questions that people may ask about your product. Yeah? And again, you have to give answers in very clear and simple terms. And we often iterate on these two documents maybe 10 to 15 times to make sure that they are absolutely clear and as simple as possible. Then you write a document about the user interaction, uh, basically how are customers going to use my product, and then parts of the user manual. So 
sort of concepts and how-tos and things like that. And at the end of this, you end up with a set of documents that exactly describe what you're going to deliver and not more than that. And that really then drives our engineering efforts to build this product. With all of this, I want you to leave you with a quote from Joe Ito, the director of the Media Lab of MIT, that says, if you want to increase innovation, you have to lower the cost of failure. So you have to do that both in terms of organization, yeah? that people's career don't go down the drain if they're part of a failed project, or you, know, you want to make sure that you have technology that is really cheap. And it needs to become a badge of honor to have learned from your failures. So with that, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of MISC, I hope you were taking notes. There you have it, a recipe for success from Amazon. Be firm on your vision, but flexible on how to get there. But how does it actually work? Let's bring in Henry Elkis, 22 years old. He set up his first company at the age of 15, a clothing company. And then at 21, when he was at Yale University, he dropped out. We're not asking you to drop out, just keep going. He set up the, he became the CEO and founder of Helena. It is a company, half of its members are under the age of 25, so about the age of many of you here. The other half are people who've made it in their field. Henry, tell us, when you approached Helena, what was it you wanted to break down and then build in terms of a new organization? Sure. I think the first thing we looked at was the structure of the 21st century and what was different between the 20th and the 21st century. Um, and the very first thing we looked at was population. So over half the world, or about half the world's population, is actually now under 25 years old, and a, a good majority of that is in developing nations. And what's particularly interesting about this youth generation is that we have a higher concentration of world leaders that happen to be young. People that, oh, and it's, it's not that they're cute and they're 22 years old and they've done something impressive, people that are legitimately at the top of their fields at a young age. Um, so the, you know, some of the, the, the founders of the top five tech companies in history were all under the age of 25 years old, and we have an 18-year-old Nobel Peace Prize winner. Um, and the most important thing about this generation is that the decisions that we will make as a society over the next 50 years, at least through Helena's eyes, are going to be some of the most consequential decisions uh, for the human race in history. Um, and the people that are going to be making those decisions right now are, are in their early 20s. So one of the core components of Helena was that if you were going to run a group of leaders and bring them together, um, and you didn't have these, these young leaders in, involved, that you might be a niche organization, you might be missing out on some of the most impactful and unavoidable trends in the world. So including half of the group at age 25 or under was essential for that. And then the other two things, very simply, was making each of our members from a completely separate field. I think one of our core beliefs is that fields are a bit arbitrary, fields are a bit forced. Um, and if you're going to address a lot of the, the very complex problems we have in the 21st century, and you just have politicians, or you just have a, a economists, or you just have financiers, you're not going to do it correctly. And then the final thing was how frequently we met. Um, if all of you in the crowd you know, worked one day a year at what you do, you'd be very bad at what you do. So we thought it was logical that people should come together in summits once a year to try to take on some of the world's most intractable problems. We thought it would be a better solution to meet consistently throughout the year um, to take on uh, big issues because big issues are hard to take on. They're complex. They require sustained collaboration over time. So all of that came together to create the organizational structure for Helena, which we feel is a, a better uh, structure for the 21st century when you look at bringing together world leaders to take on objective solutions to big problems. So very good, very inspiring. If you want new ideas, you need to bring in new people, and you need to bring in people who are going to be the 21st century leaders. Some good advice from Henry. Let's go now to Pierre-Alain Manson. You call yourself a serial entrepreneur, and that's legal, we understand. You set up your first company when you were 20, and now you have what's called Seed Stars. It's a worldwide company trying to make the world a better place. When you started, what was it that you was driving you in terms of doing it in a new way? Yeah, so um, when I started my first company, I was about 20. Um, and uh, a couple of months after founding the company, we had something like 20 employees. And I thought to myself, that's crazy. I just started with a white piece of paper, and now basically 20 people are, family, are feeding their families with what I created. So uh, that's, that was for me um, quite, uh, quite insightful. And a few years later, when we decided to uh, launch Seed Stars, we said, okay, um, we want to do the same, actually. We want to have an impact on people's life. We don't know exactly how it's going to work, etc. but we believe that entrepreneurship and technology is the way to go. So that's what we, that's what we did, and we started to invest uh, in companies in emerging markets, and now we are active in 80 countries uh, from Latin America, Africa, Asia, 
focusing only on only on these markets, uh, and that's I think that was for me the main motivation, and it still is. Honestly, if you just do and you just start a business for money, you won't last because you wake up every day and the challenge is so hard that at some point you would just give up. So if you have a real motivation, like the impact that we have and that we want to have, uh, honestly, that's why I wake up every morning because I know that why, why I'm doing that and that's what motivates me actually and the whole team uh, as well. Very good. Money matters. You need it to, have to start a startup, but motivation matters even more. There you have two very good examples from two young people who didn't join a company, they started their own. But let's bring in Ronnie Rostrom from a big successful company like GE. You're leading the innovation strategy across the region. Werner gave us some really good ideas about how to organize to achieve the goals. Did you pick up something from him that you do similarly, or maybe you do it different? So I'd say, uh, I'd say for sure, Werner's reference to being customer centric. Right, focusing 100% on what are you trying to solve for? What outcomes do you desire from that? Who is it going to serve? What impact are you trying to create? So this having the customer really at the, at the heart of the problem that we're trying to solve, the issues. And so when you look at you know, what we're doing today, healthcare, energy, uh, aviation, across the board, oil and gas, all these, pro all these you know, great opportunities, even when we root it you know, in, in, you know, here in the kingdom and what we're trying to do, and look at Saudi 2030 vision with all this potential uh, with the youth, you know, there are so much ample opportunity for us to be really focusing on tackling some real issues here on the ground. So I'd say starting with the customer at the heart of the issue, at the, at the heart of the problem, and then being able to take a step back, look at the big picture, and then really try to solve from there. I think in this way, going back to collaborative innovation, I think you can get the right partners around the table, right? Because it's, it's not a world anymore where we're trying to solve in silo, where we're, we're, we know that there, we need other pieces of the puzzle to really do this right. So I think, but really getting the right partners together is having really an eye and, and focus on what are we trying to solve for and who are we trying to solve it for? Who is it going to help? Customer-centric, she says. You remember that old phrase, the customer is always right? And sometimes you think, well, actually, I think they're wrong this time. Both Werner and Rania said you have to put the customer, not competition, at the heart of your strategy. Now, that, you're hearing that from the private sector, very successful companies in the private sector. But what if your customer is the people? What if you work in government? And there's Anas Al Faris. He has studied every possible discipline from engineering to math to computer science, but he says he wants to break down the disciplines, break down those silos. He's now the Vice President for Research at the King Abdulaziz uh, City for Science and Technology. You must have the hardest job of all because they really do work in their silos when it comes to research. Uh, definitely. Uh, uh, when, we, when we try to look at disciplines, uh, to me they're, they're more like nodes within a network. Uh, interdisciplinary work is, is more like the links between those, those nodes. However, in, in our case, we, we like to be antidisciplinary. We're looking in, in the nodes and the links that have not been created yet. Uh, those are, are more interesting. They're the gray areas, if you may, that we believe really more innovation could, could come through. Um, in, in, in my own lab, we have a, a combination of, of uh, engineers, computer scientists, and, and computational visual artists as well. Uh, all working collaboratively, and 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 that's really where we start seeing more of, of learning happen. Uh, so, so yes, I'm I'm definitely anti-discipline. <laughs> I'm going to bring I'm going to bring Henry back in here. Let's because a lot of people in the audience must be thinking, wow, that's really brave that you set up this company. You went to very very established people in their field. How hard was it to break down those barriers that people said, oh? That's nice, you know, you're a young guy, Henry, when you grow up a bit. Well, did, was there a barrier to break down? It was extremely hard. Um, I think what you learn is you only need one to say yes. Um, and we were very lucky, our first member was Myron Scholes, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, and he bet on the organization early. Um, and he, he gave us the gift of actually sitting down and going through the structure in detail, and, and I think respected us and didn't look at our age when we founded it. Um, and it really only takes one. We, we emailed millions, or what seemed like millions and millions of people. Um, but it really only does. It really only does take one. 
And I think the other thing which is, can be quite terrifying for anyone of any age when you're starting out is about failure. What if you make a mistake? We heard from Werner about the lessons of mistakes. We heard last night about how you had to fail fast and learn fast. John, Anna, what, what, when you first started, was there mistakes that helped you on the way to, to become better at what you did? Yeah, I only do mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's how I learn. And honestly, for me, that's the... That's, uh, so my first company, definitely, we did a lot of mistakes. To be very pragmatic, like, for example, we didn't have any shareholder agreement or something because, hey, hey, we're friends, we're all together, and let's start this thing together. It's okay in the beginning, but then, then when you start making money, that's when you have to take hard decisions and stuff. And suddenly that's when the problem arises and when it's not clear uh, from the beginning how you're going to handle these issues, then you have a problem. And of course it fails sometimes and that's how you learn. And I think also the way we work is around failure. Um, we have this methodology where we use um, experiments and basically uh, that's what we do every week. We look at new experiments and 99% of the times these experiments fail but one of them succeeds. And that's how you get to the next step. You know, you try this new feature, does it work? Yes, no, and that's how we, we move forward. But if you look at it, 99% failed. Same, if you like, look at the conversion rates on the websites, 99% of the people that come on your website don't buy something. This is one, one or 2% conversion rate. So you can see 99 or 98% of failure again. So I think for me, it's really intrinsic, intrinsic to, the, to the entrepreneurship activity where Failing is just part of it, and you accept it, and that's how you learn. Uh, but you must fail, and that's what you said I think, in your presentation, you must learn from these mistakes. Because mm -hmm. if you just fail without learning, of course, that's, that's useless. But of course, we don't want to focus on the failures. Everyone here wants to, to aspire to be successful at what you set out to be. I mean, Rania, this is, it's a very nice idea to talk about failure, to learning from failures, but it is still a highly competitive market, and sometimes money is in short supply. Are there pressures within the private sector, though, to, to quickly move toward that success? Yeah, and I think one of the ways of doing that, Lise, is by also focusing on investing in the capacity building, right? Making sure that we've got the right skill sets to be able to do collaborative innovation successfully, right? Meaning, so for example, one of the things that we've done here in the kingdom is a program called GE Garages, right? Exper experiential, it's educational, and it really takes you know, boys and girls, so we're starting at kind of the young age, young generation, schools, all the way up to universities, as well as customers, what are all these new skill sets that we need? When we think about digital and, 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 and coding, when we think about additive printing, what does it mean in terms of visualizing and reimagining what you can create? And so, I, like, so through that program, we've been running it a number of years, and we've trained over like 500 people. Uh, I think this is how you start. You've got to build the ecosystem with you. Um, and I think that's a huge chunk of the investment needs to go there, because if we want it right at the tail end, we need to start at the beginning and make sure that we're being inclusive as we approach collaborative innovation. Um, and I think that way we've got really sustainable impact and, and one that drives real change. And Anas, you're, you're sitting there thinking, listening to these, the private sector on, on various scales. What for you now is the biggest barrier? Because we have to say that fast, funky and fun is not usually the description given to bureaucrats or scientists. Uh, I, I think, uh, well, in the context at least of, of Saudi Arabia, I think the, the biggest barrier remains to be human capital and, and, mm. and how we develop our own human capital is, is critical. Uh, uh, similar to, to, to the comment here on, on creating uh, programs, we, we were very keen on, on, on creating a, a specific program called the Advanced Training Program in, in which we were trying to identify the, the, best of, the best of what Saudi Arabia has to offer. Um, we train them. Uh, it's a two-year aggressive program. Uh, we, we, we set up collaborations with international uh, uh, research entities, uh, so uh, uh, MIT, my home base, but, but Stanford, Berkeley, um, Caltech, uh, Michigan, uh, UC San Diego, UC Santa Barbara, Oxford, Cambridge, so the UK as well as there. And, and, and the way we, we try to do it is, is uh, so for example, in the case of, of MIT, we would, we would take students, Saudi students, and, and have them really work with the MIT faculty, spend time at MIT, uh, publish uh, uh, with the MIT faculty, and in doing so, elevate their chances 
chances uh, dramatically of, of penetrating uh, top tier universities. We've been we've been very very fortunate in in that in that realm at least uh, for the last three plus years now. We have more than 80. Uh, students in the top 20 universities, um, and, and, and by far the, the largest number of graduate students say, in, in MIT specifically. Uh, so, so again, from my perspective, it's, it's definitely human capital and, and, and trying to really understand how we, we produce or, or enable the, those next generation of, of uh, scientists. Hmm. Werner, I'm going to bring you back in because, of course, you speak from someone who's working at the biggest scale possible at Amazon, where human capital is not a problem, resources are not a problem. You've heard now from these entrepreneurs, and in, oh, yeah, there is a problem, even for you? <laughs> oh. Um, but that kind of advice you gave, you know, speaking from the, the summit of, of Amazon, do you want to pick up on what we've heard now from our other participants about how others can move forward? Yeah, actually, I want to make a point first about something that you said earlier. Um, you can make money the most important thing in your company. Um, there's, you can, there's a difference between mercenary and missionaries. <laughs> I think mercenaries are the ones that are really looking forward, they're in it for the money. I think that makes, mercenaries have a very hard time, especially if you cannot get to success really quickly. You really need to be a missionary if you really want to wake up every day to be able to work on this problem, this may be very hard. And, and I, if, in the letter to shareholders in 97, Jeff laid out the principles of the company, Jeff Bezos. And number one was, if you're a short-term investor, do not invest in Amazon. Yeah? And I think we've demonstrated over time that we were willing to cannibalize our quarterly results in, result, in, in exchange for innovation. Yeah? So you need to be willing to have this long-term view. Now, that's easier in a company that is, has been successful, like Amazon, where you could fund these act act activities, but you, you have two different, I think, young businesses. One of them is one that we are, one type is where we, we often look at the glamour of it. Yeah, that grows really fast, acquires co customers really quickly, and is actually not making any money. It's bleeding money. Yeah, so their goal is in customer acquisition. And then there's the other type of company, which I would call a sustain, building a sustainable business. A business that will be in business for a very long time. And with that, you basically have to do something weird, which is namely charge customers for the products that you build. Mm. Yeah, and that's not something that we, very, that we see that much in, in news about. But really trying to build a sustainable business is probably definitely in areas that have no massive customer growth where you're not going to be acquired really quickly is a really viable approach. And you see that, for example, here in the region, but also in Asia and in uh, South Af in Africa, for example, where entrepreneurs are really focused on building a sustainable business instead of these high growth explosive businesses. Pierre, I know you're listening there and you're nodding, but are you in a different kind of business? You're trying to work at some of the very basic issues of life, you know, health services and education, in populations where people don't have a lot of money. So how do you come up with a sustainable model? Yeah, that's the tricky, that's the tricky part. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I totally agree with you, Vanna, honestly. That, and that's, uh, especially in the markets we operate, the emerging markets, indeed, the m and activity is not as strong as you, what we, you would find in the US or in Europe. So you cannot bet on uh, this big company acquiring you because of your user base or something like that. You have to find uh, a sustainable model. Now, on the question, for example, education. Uh, education, we, that's one of the, of the market we are active in. Uh, we've just launched an incubation program in Ivory Coast targeting uh, education companies. Um, and we've looked at it and we said, okay, it has to be sustainable, so we have to make money uh, with that so that we can have an impact in the long term. And we've looked who, who's paying, who can pay for the education. So of course there is the government, so we have a deal with the government and trying to build programs with them, etc. cetera. Um, we have some of the top of the pyramid that can pay, uh, the rich uh, people in the country, and that's more of the Tesla strategy, where, right? Where you start with these high-end kind of product, and then you find a way to give it to the masses. So that's a second strategy that that um, we took. Uh, and finally, the corporates, uh, because we mentioned talents, for example. Uh, Everybody is looking for talents, and on the other side, you have the education. So we're trying to find models where uh, that, that is a win-win for corporates and for young talents that are looking for education. So that's how we tackle the problem, saying, okay, where is the money? How can we make it sustainable? And then trying to find strategies and products around that, for mm -hmm. example. And Henry, is there a kind of a conflict between innovation, trying to be flexible enough, as we heard from Werner, to come up with these new ideas, those new ways of thinking together, but on the same time, 
You've got to pay salaries. There's got to be a bottom line. You have to convince your investors this is something worth investing in. I actually think there's an argument uh, to say that when you have a dearth of capital, when you don't have as much capital, you have to be even more innovative. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be even more agile. And if you look at the histories of a lot of uh, very successful companies and even nonprofits that are, that are more innovative, uh, they've started off at, at the very beginning. One of the examples I, I really love is Charity Water, uh, Scott Harrison's nonprofit. Um, they, they did not raise a lot of money for the first couple of years. Um, and the inventive marketing that they were able to pull off uh, going to Times Square, filling bottles up with polluted water um, could not have happened if you asked Scott if they had a lot of money. Um, and I think there's a lot of parallels there. And in our case, you know, we, we, we don't have tons of money. We're, you know, at the very beginning, we obviously struggled to raise money just like any other organization. And um, we had to be very agile, we had to be very inventive. Um, and there's a lot of failures of, of companies that are very, very well funded or famously funded because they have a burden uh, to succeed at a higher level because they build hype. Um, so I would actually say the opposite. I think there's, there, there's a... Uh, um, th there's definitely a good thing, and a lot of entrepreneurs don't realize it when they don't have a lot of money. And then they, I think, looking back upon it, uh, I think after they're successful, they, they see a lot of advantages and they see a lot of growth that, that occurred at the early portions. That's a very good way of seeing the, the glass half, half full rather than half empty. Ronnie, you've got a lot of experience. What about the last bit of advice for all of these young people listening here about how do they get started and where do they head from your experience working on innovation for the region? So I think, you know, and, and it's so energizing, right? And like just even like turning my head now, just like looking at the crowd, it's so energizing to be here. And I think there's ample opportunity. I, I think one of the key things is, you know, we're at the stage where we have to, you know, invest in relearning a lot of what we know. And it's, but it, particularly with the youth, I think it's like, you know, soak it in, taking, uh, uh, you know, just this, many opportunities as possible to learn new skill sets. You know, I, I go back and, you know, to, you're looking at a world where there's digital transformation. We heard a lot about that this morning and last night as well. Uh, we're looking at the fact that the way we design and manufacture is going to completely radicalize, you know, and, and change. Uh, so, you know, with additive printing, the barriers are going to be, you know, much lower for entrepreneurs and startups to, you know, think of new products. So invest in yourself and learning all these kind of like new future of work skill sets. Uh, uh, I think that's really critical. I think also the other thing I would say is, uh, is, is be bold, right? I think it's just having the courage and to go for it. Uh, I think you know what I see and from everything that I've heard this morning as well there are so many institutions and entities and different kind of partners that want to come to the table and help to see and you know really foster this ecosystem because even as a big corporate you know we need the young innovators we need the young entrepreneurs and and we want to be working with them together on on solving this and so I think the kingdom you know really is uh, is um, is at a unique uh, you know juncture in terms of uh, uh, embracing all this energy from from the youth and but we need the new skill sets and we need to focus that energy on solving for problems that you know the the here the country wants to wants to, is, is looking at so that's that's what I would say to all the, the young uh, people sitting out there and maybe on one more note I'd say uh, we spend as GE we also focus a lot on uh, on investing in 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 women because we realize that's an important part of the equation uh, and so we've had programs that, you know, STEM programs in, in particular around women to see how we can, you know, propel that forward and, and make sure that's, uh, uh, you know, really being uh, uh, used in, in our economies. We're very proud of, uh, uh, we have a young, uh, a group of young female uh, uh, digital uh, uh, designers that came up with a great app for the Ministry of Health, for example. Like, there's just a lot of these examples. Mm. Good. That's great. That's great to hear. Anna Salafaris, a very quick word of wisdom from you. You've studied at the best and the brightest universities in Saudi Arabia and around the world. Uh, well, uh, I don't think I have too much of an advice beyond uh, plan. Definitely plan for your future. Uh, we're, uh, we're fortunate in, in, the, in, the, in the context of Saudi Arabia, and I do say fortunate, to have the majority of our population more younger and more youthful. Um, that, that being said, I, I go with, with the argument always to, to all my students, uh, plan knowing for a fact that your plans will change. Um, and, and with that, uh, um, I, I end it. Okay, so Anna Salfarvis tells you plan. Rania tells you be bold. A word of wisdom from you, Henry? 
don't forget the humanities. Uh, um, there's a lot of incredible engineering going on in the world. Uh, computer science is, is the burgeoning. It's, it's, it's an unavoidable trend. Artificial intelligence is an unavoidable trend. Uh, but philosophers are still needed in the world. People that study humanities, people that can think about the ethical decisions that need to be made uh, in conjunction with, um, with engineering. So that's one thing I could tell people in the crowd that are still in school, uh, is don't neglect humanities. It's, it's one of the most important things to study, and it's one of the most important uh, things that will be needed in the world for, for, for leaders. Humanities, don't forget humanities, and most of all, be human. Pierre Alain, a little word of wisdom from you, or a big one even. Um, oh, maybe it's a philosophy of life. Mm -hmm. uh, think maybe when you'll be 90 and look back your life, what you want to have accomplished. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, I think that just helps you to take decisions on a day to day, saying, okay, that's, I, that's my objective in life, and that's what I do. I don't know if it's the best advice, but that's what, what I do on, on my own. 90, by the time you're 90, you're going to have to set up a zillion companies. <laughs> <laughs> Werner? Um, I don't know, be scrappy. You know, if you don't kick that ball, you can't score. So you have to start at one moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if we look at um, two, three years, now, let's say eight years ago, typical investment you needed for to start a small internet company would have been $2 million. Now with open source and cloud, it's 50,000. Yeah, with that, you have quite a bit of run runaway. Don't look at the media too much. Yeah? The fact that you get featured in TechCrunch once doesn't build your business. Yeah? <laughs> business is the thing that you do by delivering goods and services to your customers. Focus on them. Focus on what you need to deliver for them because long after that TechCrunch article is over, yeah, you still need to run your business. Focus on delivering that and not too much on, say, the glamour of it. Ooh. No, no glamour, lots of guts. Let's, let's, just, let's hear one last word from all of you. Let's do a show of hands in the audience. After hearing all this, how many of you in the audience want to set up your own company to do the boldest act of all? Just show us your hands. I'm a, wow. Yeah. Look at that. Way to go. But let's, let's not forget, how many of you are thinking, uh, hoping you'll get a job in one of those government institutions that Anna Alfaris is part of? Well, I'm, I'm also raising my hand. <laughs> <laughs> not too many. Not too many work about the government. And I, you know, oh, there you go, there you go, one woman with her hand high up in the air. You know, I don't even want to ask this question, but I will anyway. But does, how many of you are still scared after all you've heard? I hope this, this session has energized you rather than intimidated you. Is there anyone who's still a little bit worried in the audience? Well, you should be scared. There's the boldest ones of all. It takes courage to, to say that. Let us end this, what was a fabulous session. I think, wow, this is free advice for all of you in the audience. And what is that motto of Amazon? Work hard, have fun, make history. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>